That's right. <laughs> so hello from my side. Um, my name is Lena or Magdalena Heubiser. I'm the campaigner of Stay Grounded and also co-author of the report. And um, yes, I'm happy to have this webinar with you on the occasion of the launch of the new report. I just got the print version sent today. Um, you might have seen it already online. So this is the second report Stay Grounded has published so far. The first one was on the illusion of green flying, analyzing the existing attempts by the aviation industry and showing that these actually don't lead to a reduction in emissions, but cause even more problems. So um, we did know what we don't want, but realized that it was a gap in analysis of what we actually do want. So this is why we organized the conference Degrowth of Aviation in July in Barcelona, where about 150 people participated, both in Barcelona and online. And there were numerous workshops, panel discussions, and action at the airport. But the most important were probably seven parallel working groups on concrete measures to degrow aviation. Beforehand, um, briefing papers were elaborated so all participants could start the discussion at the same level. And the outcomes of the conference fed into this report, plus further discussions and feedback loops. So um, this report, is it, it's not really a position paper or it's not really the opinion of Stay Grounded, but it is, um, it is a document that tries to um, to foster discussions around how to degrow aviation. Um, it might seem visionary or radical what we present there as solutions, but actually it is not so completely out of the blue. Um, this year, every one of these policies, the grounded outlines, or the main ones at least, are being considered by some governments or mainstream parties in Europe. For example, the Labour Party in the UK supports a frequent fly levy. Green MPs in the Netherlands want, a short -haul, uh, want to ban short-haul flights. Germany is raising taxes on aviation, at least a bit, and decreases costs on train travel. Advisory bodies in France and in the UK warn that airport expansion will make it harder to reach the climate targets. And the EU is trying to figure out how to end a tax exemption for kerosene. And to quote today's Politico newsletter, European aviation is still growing, but the industry has much to fear from the likes of Stay Grounded, especially if all their recommendations are implemented. <laughs> so let's take a look um, at all those recommendations. This is the agenda for the webinar. Um, we would like to start with a short round of introduction because um, this is not only a, an input by, by us, um, it is also, the aim is also to, to interactively discuss, so it would be nice to, to know this part of this webinar. And then um, there will be an input by Tony Smith, the editor, and me. So first we will, we will know why we actually talk about degrowth and then take a look into the different measures to degrow aviation. Then there will be a slot for questions of understanding. And um, then we will have some um, a discussion part with the breakout groups on this question of why or what are actually socially just measures. You might have noticed that the subtitle of our report is um, reducing air travel in a just way. So this is really cool for for us to think about how, how can those measures be not exclusive. Um, so we would like to know also from your side, what, what do you think about that? Then um, we will do a short summary and lessons learned from the report and then have time for general discussion and some closing remarks. Okay. okay. Um, then I would like to introduce uh, our speaker today and the editor of this report, Tone Smith. Thank you very much for being here, Tone. Tone is an ecological economist 
who worked as an in independent researcher and writer. And um, uh, among other things, she worked at the Statistics Norway, producing environmental statistics. And she has been active in the international degrowth movement already for many years. Now she's also board member of Rethinking Economics Norway, and she currently lives in Vienna. And um, I want to thank you very much, Tone, for being here and for all the work you did on this report. And I'm really happy to have your presentation now on the report and um, the different measures to reduce aviation. Welcome. Thank you, Anna. Um, can you see me now? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you, Anna, and thank you everyone for joining. And thanks everyone who played into this report. We are, I think we're 20 co-authors or something. So there's quite a lot of uh, people and text to, um, yeah, to edit and to put together. But um, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> what I want to do is to give a little bit of context about uh, aviation before we start on the measures. I know that all of you are partly familiar with the problems with aviation, but there are a few messages we just want to highlight up front and then we will continue with the uh, concrete measures that we have really explored in depth in this report. So one of the things that uh, we think are really, is really important to get across in the report and also for the wider communication of the whole issue of aviation is the full climate impact of aviation. So as you can see on this uh, figure on the left hand side of the slide, it shows the climate impact of different modes of transport. It's a bit small, but you can probably see the, the bars. So the bottom one uh, is the biggest one and, and flying is clearly the most uh, climate unfriendly mode of transport. But the really important thing in all this is that typically the aviation sector itself tend to say that, or tend to point out that uh, aviation only accounts for 2% of world or global CO2 emissions. But what is really important is that we communicate that this is not the only uh, climate impact of aviation. That actually, if we take into account other things like, especially um, injured cloudiness, ozone and, and contrails, uh, the climate impact actually more than doubles. So these are really important figures to have up front. It is not only the innocent 2%, but much more. And on top of that, we know that only 10% of the world popula population roughly have ever set foot on a plane. Uh, and many of those don't fly very frequently. So there's really a very small uh, portion of the world global world population that accounts for these emissions and these climate impacts. And of course, there are also other environmental impacts related to aviation. Um, especially for people around airports, noise is important, but also local air pollution, sealing of agricultural soils, and uh, local pollution of the earth, soil and, and groundwater in the surroundings. So all these things are really important to, to um, lift up front when we talk about aviation. And I also want to say that these 2% of the world's CO2 emissions are only accounted for by civil aviation. So most of the figures that we haven't presented in this report relate to the civil aviation sector. It's very hard to get hold of numbers related to the military uh, sector or military aviation. Um, it doesn't mean it's not important and we shouldn't address it, but we don't have so much. Well, it's a kind of a separate issue. So I will mostly talk about the first category. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so so this is the picture we know that it's a very damaging way of travel. Um, still, what's also important to know is that is in the 20 year period between 1990 and 2010, international aviation grew with 70%. The CO2 emissions from international aviation increased by 70%. Uh, for comparison, the global CO2 emission increased by 25%. So the aviation sector is really a strongly growing sector. So we know that it's already <laughs> an unfriendly means of transportation. It's growing heavily. 
plus it's expected to double over the next um, 20 years from 2020 to, to 2040. The sector expects and plans for, for a doubling of aircrafts and passenger kilometers flown. So, um, yeah, so this is really the situation that um, the aviation sector itself has understood that they have to address these kind of critiques and issue. So as uh, Lena uh, showed at the beginning, uh, Stay Grounded has already published this report on the illusions of green flying, so I'm not going to say so much, but basically the solutions put forth by the sector itself cannot lead to uh, the needed reduction in, in greenhouse gases or CO2 emissions. Uh, we know that we need to, if we want to achieve the Paris Agreement targets to stay below 1.5 degrees, uh, we need to reduce by 50% in 20 years. And this is not at all in line with the plans of the aviation sector itself. So they um, actually produced this strategy then for carbon neutral growth from 2020 onwards, which relies basically on technology and offsetting. So technology as biofuels, synthetic fuels, and, um, and um, efficiency improvements. And offsetting has a lot of problem, social problems beside the fact that it doesn't really lead to, to the um, claimed uh, offsetting of emissions, but I'm not going, don't really have time to go into that now. So either we talk about it later or you read the report, but um, yeah, basically the sector's own strategy is, is based on false solutions, which also means that green growth is really uh, an illusion. So that is the wider picture of the uh, aviation industry that plays into this whole world of global world economy with long, long distance transportation, high speed, hyper mobile lifestyles. And it also means that we cannot get the change in the avi aviation sector that we need without addressing the wider systemic issues. Next, please. So degrowth, not green growth, is then uh, the way to go ahead. And um, it's not by chance that we chose the word degrowth on. Um, uh, for our report, we could have chosen the more technically uh, um, label reducing aviation, but actually by, by pointing to degrowth, we also really link up to the degrowth movement, which is much more than just reducing environmental footprint, but a whole uh, movement and a whole body of literature, but also a project for a, a radical social ecological transformation, both of the economy and, and of society, based more on ideas of sufficiency, the good life for all, and of course, entailing system change. So um, this also, part of it is also social justice, which we will come back to as we go along. Okay, so let's start with the measures. Um, in this figure, you can see some big squares and some smaller squares. So basically, we will talk mostly about the ones that are mentioned in the big squares, which are the ones that we discussed in depth in Barcelona and also um, have been exploring more in depth. And then we have a chapter, the last chapter in the report before the summary, lists a range of other uh, possible measures that we have not had time to explore and which might well be worth exploring further, but we, we we wanted to list as much ideas as possible, even if we didn't have time to go so much into it. So I will mention a few of those at the end, but may mostly focus on these six, um, yeah, six ones that we really looked into. So we will start. We'll go. I'll go along as the uh, in the order of the report and start with the tax taxation uh, topic. And. Um, Actually, the, the issue with taxation is that the aviation sector has been uh, in the very privileged situation of having a huge amount of tax uh, exemption compared to other sectors of society, besides also uh, a lot of uh, very generous subsidies or indirect subsidies from the state. And this is one of the first 
things that we think really has to come to an end, this kind of discriminatory practice of such an environmentally unfriendly sector. So in the EU alone, uh, it has been calculated that these tax exemptions um, amount to 30 to 40 million euros per year, and these figures are a few years old now. And we believe that the, the feasibility of, of getting this on the political agenda is actually quite good because it has uh, achieved uh, quite a bit of attention recently. Uh, this, the fact that the aviation sector has such a special treatment. And although this is a measure that is kind of uh, not very much in the line of systems change, it's aligned more with current kind of policy, market-based instruments and economic instruments. Uh, but still, just ending this special treatment of the aviation sector will by itself give a boost to other and more environmentally friendly means of transport by making the, the prices more, uh, yeah, by taxing aviation, the prices will be more just because currently flying is cheaper and other means of transportation often subject to VAT and so on becomes more expensive. So if we look at the next slide, we just run through the, there are a, a different kinds of taxes that one can think about. So if you look at the figure on the left here, uh, it, it's very small, but it shows basically diesel, gasoline and kerosene. And these are average, um, it's an average across a range of OECD countries, uh, combining fuel excise and carbon tax on these uh, fuels. But basically it just shows how much kerosene is under tax everywhere. So one can imagine a similar kind of excise tax on kerosene. One of the arguments uh, that this hasn't happened so yet is, uh, happened yet is that uh, uh, there is the, um, there was in 1944, a, um, the Chicago convention was established on international civil aviation and this convention does not allow taxation of fuel which is on planes uh, when they land and then this have led to some kind of norms of wider exemptions and also bilateral agreements between countries on not ta taxing but it really isn't the um, obstacle that it's presented to be there are ways to tax the kerosene definitely and uh, what is important then is to uh, remember whatever kind of, of tax we choose to put on uh, uh, aviation related fuel is that we must include this non CO2 impact of aviation. So there must be some kind of extra factor that makes the, um, the climate impact, uh, what do you call it, like um, fine, higher. It's also currently discussed quite a bit about carbon tax. We have an economy-wide carbon tax so that every sector in the economy uh, pays this, this or is subject to the same kind of carbon tax, which could have the advantage that it could include biofuels and synthetic fuels, unlike kerosene. But the problem with both kerosene and carbon tax today is that they don't, wouldn't actually allow this because uh, these kind of uh, the biofuel and synthetic fuel uh, emissions or impacts are not reported to the United Nations under the United Nations climate reporting. So it is also not taxed because it's, these things often go together. So this is something to fight for and be aware of. Uh, then VAT uh, is not allowed to, to um, put on international flight tickets. So this is another reason why there is exemptions for the air, air um, industry, but many countries have then instead uh, installed a ticket tax, and this is a way to get around this rule as well. But to tax on the ticket, and it's also quite easy to do. For example, in the EU, it makes it easier because you don't need the agreement across the union, but it can be done on a national level. So these are various kinds of uh, ways that the tax exemptions for the aviation industry could be approached. Next, please. So another kind of um, fiscal measure is uh, 
is a frequent flyer or an air, air miles levy. And these levies um, are, um, the starting point for these levies is the social ju justice perspective. So unlike normal taxation, which is not usually considered to be very socially progressive because everybody pays the same amount, so the rich can more easily fly than the non-rich, this kind of a levy is then meant to take that into account. Uh, it aims to one is the frequent flyer levy, FFL, which um, would be set up so that you pay a levy when you for every flight you take or every flight beyond the first. Maybe the idea is something like if you fly once in three to four years, you don't pay anything. But for your second fl flight in that period, you could pay, for example, a levy of 150 euros. And if you have any, yet another flight, it would double and so on. Um, another version is that you, the distance is taken into account so that the levy that you pay depends on the distance you fly because after all, um, the, the longer distance, the more climate impact. Um, yeah, and uh, we also believe that this can be a measure which is quite easy to get uh, political acceptance for because it clearly takes the social, social justice perspective into account and also because most people are not frequent flyers. So in the UK, for example, 10% um, of those 10% um, most frequent flyers took half of the flights that went abroad. And this means that for the majority of the people, this might feel like a tax that might be easier to get acceptance for than the other kind of taxes. As taxation often has this disadvantage that people are not very happy about taxes. So this could be a different way to implement it. And um, revenues from both taxes and, and uh, these levies can be ear earmarked, maybe more easily from a, uh, from a levy, earmarked, for example, for uh, developing alternative modes of transportation, for doing that in the global south, or part of it could be used for um, those kinds of modes of transportation in the global south, or even for uh, some kind of just transition fund to uh, transition out of this aviation uh, intensive economy that we currently have. Next, please. Yeah, so those are the two fiscal uh, measures that we have been exploring in the report. Now, the problem with fiscal measures is that people can always buy themselves out if they have enough money. Even the frequent flyer levy, which might become very expensive after many flights, if you have enough money, you can still pay yourself out. So it, in some ways, is it still unfair? And um, in some ways, we also don't know to which extent it will actually impact on flying habits. So these are all then assumptions of how much people was, will reduce their flying if the prices go up. And unlike those kinds of measures, limiting flights, it's something that we definitely know what the outcome of such a rule would be. So if you set a, a cap on the amount of flights between two cities or, or ban any flights uh, on a route in, which is a short distance route, it is very easy to know the effect on, on, the, on the climate or on CO2 emissions and other climate impacts. And in this respect, it's also fairer because it will then actually not be possible to buy yourself out. Everybody will have to change to a different means of transportation. And interestingly, this seemed to be quite um, a difficult measure just a short time ago, a couple of years ago. Uh, the kind of uh, proposals that people would really object because it's seen as intruding into personal freedom and so on. But uh, in the very 
last months mostly, these kinds of uh, suggestions are already gaining ground. So it's been discussed in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in France, uh, and also some prominent politicians and other uh, scientists are speaking out for at least banning short haul flights um, on distances where you can get from A to B with a train in, in four hours. It doesn't even make sense to fly. You don't even save any time. So yeah, so this is uh, becoming feasible when we talk about short haul maybe we require a bit more work if we're talking about longer distance uh, distance um, flights still so the next please this is the other kind of uh, ban or limitation that we can think about is to to uh, address the airport or the infrastructure rather than the planes so Currently, uh, in the world, there is more than, that we know of at least, more than 1,200 infrastructure projects going on in terms of new airports, expansion of airports, expansion of runways or related infrastructure. And uh, yeah, we have a nice map here which shows many of the conflicts related to these airport expansions. So this map has been uh, prepared in um, in cooperation between Stay Grounded and the uh, Barcelona Uni uh, Autonomous University. There is a group they're working on this environmental justice project, and I think Rose, who's with us, is also, was part of making this map. So this is really great work that you can see on our websites. The um, the yellow dots on this map uh, indicate 60 airport-related con conflicts that have been investigated by this group. So you can read about each, each and single of these uh, conflicts online. And the black ones are still to be investigated. But this is the amount of conflicts that uh, is currently going on related to airport expansions worldwide. So. Yeah, so another, uh, another measure then to consider is actually to work for, for moratoria on, on new projects, new airport infrastructure or, or expansion projects. And this, or what we call a red line for airports. So we've been doing various um, actions across many countries um, illustrating this line as a kind of a uh, activity in the airports and these uh, kind of uh, this attempt to, to get a moratoria has been uh, inspired by certain other uh, policy areas like uh, the nuclear power moratorium in Germany, coal moratorium in the US, the international whaling moratorium and in terms of uh, airport uh, the idea is to establish some kind of building moratorium related to airports and it has to have a little bit of success i mean the um, there has been quite a bit of success in terms of resisting airport expansions in many places uh, you can read about several of them in the report in in uh, vienna it's it's a little bit in between there is um, it's been a success in France, in Notre Dame de Lange. There are some examples from Bangladesh and Thailand. But I think the only example we found where there has really been an, a moratorium agreed is in Munich, where the Bavarian... Yeah, so another interesting thing about this measure is that it doesn't need to be uh, adapted on a state level, government level, but it can be also implemented by regional government or even city governments. So the Bavarian government, after a referendum, actually decided in 2018 to, to um, put in place a moratorium against the, the expansion of the Munich airport that should last for five years. So that's, uh, yeah, that is a success. Another thing which uh, relates to airport is that if we actually 
manage to reduce flying and even um, yeah, to, to stop expansion, but also to reduce flying, which is the aim of our campaigns, then we also need to start to think about scaling down, especially regional airports will be superfluous with uh, shifting to more train and bus and maybe other means. Next, please. Yes, so we need to foster alternatives to flying. So if we want to reduce flying, there must be alternative means of uh, transportation and there also needs to be some considerations of whether we need to travel so much and so far, of course. But um, one thing is to encourage governments to invest in these alternative uh, transportation networks. Um, like especially night trains, which has been uh, uh, more or less abandoned in Europe in the last decades, but is, uh, is now coming back quite strongly, much, uh, much thanks to uh, the Austrian railway lines. There are still a few night trains in Central Europe, and now it seems like they're coming back in many places. Um, also to consider night buses in places where there isn't uh, train line system already and finally also to actually modernize uh, ferries in an ecological way to make use of renewable propulsion such, such as wind and and sun and um, hybrid ferries so that the waterways can again be a way to transport people also in an environmentally friendly way um, so besides different kinds of uh, me means of transport, it's also important that it's possible to easily book journeys uh, that interlink different kinds of um, con different countries, trains and things like this. It's quite difficult today if you want, need to book several laps to go too far away. And also the connection times need to be um, better coordinated. And not least, uh, reducing travel by using video conferencing more. So what we also have in this chapter is uh, some visions for thinking about tourism and traveling in a new way. Um, so that this is not only about limiting people's freedom, but really thinking about what would it mean to travel more slowly and or travel less and what else, how could we fulfill the same need? And um, here, I think the degrowth movement's visions come in very much. How can we think about doing less travel, doing it slower, doing it just every so and so many years, but then taking the time, enjoying the journey itself, making it possible to travel while uh, work while we travel, considering whether to visit the local uh, expat communities and their restaurants and, com and events instead of having to go to visit their country, things like this. Um, or even, yeah, actually having people to show the way uh, to be good ambassadors for a different way of traveling and making slow travel the new cool. Um, but also we need to consider to reduce transportation. So one thing is work travel but also tourism, uh, especially in many places like Barcelona, where the conference took place, is really completely overwhelmed by tourism and it impacts on people's daily lives, on where they can afford to live, on the public services available. And um, it, is, it, makes, it makes that several places now are starting to have a really um, local campaigns against tourism and wanting to reduce it, not only making it more sustainable and so on. And finally, um, it shouldn't, we should not only think about passenger transport, but there is also aviation that transports cargo. And this is part again of the global globalized economy where you uh, expect that you can have fresh fruit from anywhere at any time you want. So reducing cargo transport of things that can reduce, be produced more closely is also part of this transition to relocalize the economy and develop more bio 
or, or regional products and regional economies again. Next, please. Now, this is a different, little bit a different kind of measure then. Um, here we are talking about changing travel policies within uh, organizations, businesses, companies, and so on. So it's, a, it's more of a bottom-up measure that actors can do if they feel it takes too long to get policies in place, but there are really things that you can do on an organizational level that can have an impact as well. So putting in place a, a travel policy in the organization on a voluntary basis. And we identified some elements of what we would consider a progressive policy or what such a policy would include. So banning short haul flights in the organization would definitely be one thing. Uh, and then working for awareness of the climate impact, encouraging more video conferences, but also uh, helping to train people to use it so that the barrier to take uh, to start using these technologies don't become so high and then finally not only doing this for yourself and for your green image but actually uh, as an organization being um, um, an actor that one tries to change also the outside world so for example organization can challenge other organizations to do the same or or even um, challenge or work for uh, similar kind of policies that they become mandatory on a, on a national or regional level. Next, please. So this is the chapter where we have uh, listed lots of uh, mean, means or measures that we have not really studied in depth. And I think there are at least 10 of them. So I'm just gonna mention a few. One is uh, how we account for emissions and, um, and communicate to the public the impact of flying or the impact of airports and so on. This is uh, really important. And we want to uh, challenge that all impacts of flying are taken into account in the United Nations climate accounting system that that um, that various cities and airports and so uh, have to produce numbers to show the what the real climate impact of the activity they are doing so for example an airport which claims to be um, uh, environmentally friendly or they are carbon credited or whatever they are these days we can actually ask for different kinds of numbers where they show the indirect impact of the of the activities they're doing and this is something to to um, work for in addition to get scientists to agree on what would be a good number to use to scale up the co2 impacts to show the total impact so that there is an agreement about this across at least across many experts, because today different people use different um, factors to account for this. So that's one quite technical accounting measure, but uh, more familiar may be banning advertisement for flying. This is not because uh, similar things have been done for tobacco or even in some countries, um, alcohol. And uh, if not, banning advertisement then for example um, what has been suggested in Sweden is that a certain amount or a certain percentage of the space of the advertisement should be used to explain to the public how uh, the climate impacts of flying again a bit inspired by tobacco and how many countries have labels on tobacco um, boxes then uh, another thing we have suggested is um, a way to work for just transition is to actually work with something which might at first sight seem a, a bit uh, counterintuitive is to work with low cost uh, airline um, employees and argue for better working conditions for them. So this is really a way to line um, 
to uh, join up with uh, trade unions so that we want to do this in a, a just way so that people don't lose their jobs without anything else. And at the same time, if we actually make people in low cost airlines get better working conditions, this would lead to, to higher prices because this has been part of the low cost which has allowed flying to grow so much. And uh, it, it would really be an interesting way to, um, to show our social commitment in this process. And finally, I want to mention behavioral change because we currently have, uh, are preparing um, a campaign called Let's Stay Grounded, which will be launched next spring, which is uh, about, yeah, which builds a bit on things that has already happened, maybe particularly in Europe, where there has been already some various campaigns to change people's behavior, such as the flying shame campaign or uh, some smaller projects which has aimed to get people to sign up for not flying for a year or for not flying next summer and so on. And scaling up this kind of idea that if some people start to change their behavior and show others that is possible, then this can have a snowball effect. But the Let's Stay Grounded campaign is on top uh, Enlarging a bit the idea of behavioral change to not only be about me changing my personal behavior, but actually working politically to change that would need to be addressed on a political level as well. So that was just a few of those other means that we have uh, presented. There is more in the, the report. I think my time is out. So um, what we would do now before we do the, the breakout groups is to allow a little bit of time for questions if there is any questions of understanding or of uh, content. So we don't want to open the discussion about the measures yet, just to clarify if there is anything that needs clarification at this stage. And then I hand the word back to Anne, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Turner, for this introduction into the report. I hope all of you are now very keen on reading it. Um, so yeah, as Tona said, if you have any questions of understanding now, please raise, like concerning some of the measures or what Tona presented to us, please raise your hand. Um, if there are more like questions or discussion points, we, can, we will get to that later um, in the discussion part. Um, Ivan. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask uh, what, as I when I, you showed the map, it seemed to me like uh, Copenhagen was not mentioned uh, as one of the places with the um, uh, problems about uh, the airport. Is that correct? Tone? Yeah, uh, I have a <laughs> I have a printed map here right now that I'm looking at, which where. Denmark is a bit in the middle, but it looks correct. Yeah, so I... Um, I, I hope you will um, put it on. <laughs> exactly, thank you for that. <laughs> we okay. will definitely double check, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll give this information back to the Environmental Justice Atlas. Yeah. Um, are there questions of understanding? Okay, then uh, we'll have time later also for discussions and if, you, if there are any other questions of understanding coming up, you can post them later as well. Um, now I would hand over to Magdalena who will say some words about social and climate justice. And then after we go into breakout groups to discuss this. Exactly, so... Um, as we already mentioned, so the, the social justice um, is core for us and uh, we are part of the climate justice movement. Um, so how can actually measures to reduce aviation be socially just? Um, the aviation industry tries to sell the idea that cheap flights allow for a democratization of uh, flying because everyone can afford flights and because supposedly 
automatically flying leads to, to cultural exchange. But they conveniently omit that um, very few wealthy people take the biggest share of flights, as we already told you, um, while the immense damage um, is, is being um, while, while others have to take a wrap for that. So flying is at the core of an imperial mode of living, a form of consumption and production that is only possible because it is at, at the expense of others. Um, and for us, it is core to show that climate justice means that the global north and the global wealthy are now responsible for a larger share of the effort to combat the climate crisis. And this includes a redistribution of wealth and opportunities, um, or maybe also possibilities to fly. It also includes financial payments for liability and redress, but it is more than just a monetary process. It implies the struggle against all forms of discrimination, and it means that the measures to counter the climate crisis should not lead to new problems, like it is the case with offsetting and biofuels, and that they should also probably not include those who don't have enough money to pay enormous prices for flights. So we have a, an issue there. Um, and we would like to um, discuss with you in the breakout rooms um, how do you evaluate the presented measures from a social justice perspective? And um, when are measures to degrow aviation socially just? Then I would, uh, if there are no further comments here, we go to the general discussion after. But first, I want to hand over um, to Lena um, for a short summary. Yes, so um, what we, what our findings were, um, just to summarize, what, what are socially just measures to reduce aviation? So on the one hand, as already mentioned, those measures that don't harm or burden vulnerable groups, for example, unfair taxation or destructive projects like, like biofuels or offsets, um, also, measures that reduce a, a traffic, but actually enable mobility and cultural exchange. So I think that's a fear often um, people often have when, when we say we want a reduction of aviation, that this could mean that there is no mobility and no, no cultural exchange anymore. And actually, it is possible, in our opinion. We also have a, an info box on, on our vision. Um, in the report and we'd be happy to get your feedback on that too, maybe afterwards in a written way. Um, it is possible to enable mobility by other means of transport and also by, by online conferences and by traveling um, in a different way. And um, measures are also Socially just if they target wealthy frequent flyers more than those who almost rarely fly, as it is the case with the frequent flyer levy or the air miles levy. Um, and measures that provide a just transition for workers in the aviation sector or also in the tourist sector. Um, you already mentioned, Tona, the just transition fund um, that we propose. Um, yes. And we have been discussing a bit if it would be actually good to have measures that differentiate also between bullshit flights and necessary flights or um, like flimsy flights and necessary flights. I don't know if, you, if you've heard of the book Bullshit Chops, which became really famous. So it's, it's a term that's already used and um, it's just in order to make clear that a flight of someone who visits her family on another continent after a couple of years is maybe something totally different than um, a flight from a businessman to his Tuscan Billy 10 times a year. Um, and we haven't really come up with a clear measure for such a qualitative distinction and maybe such doesn't exist, um, at least not without loads of bureaucracy. 
but we think that the time is ripe for discussion about what's actually valid and what's unfair. Um, so this is the first part of, of the summary, what we think is socially just. Um, but of course, um, it must be clear that the measures to reduce aviation cannot lead to climate justice alone because um, because aviation is so closely linked with our transport system, with tourism, with energy, with global trade, with our economic system based on constant growth and competition and fast mobility is, is a key element of the globalized capitalism. So climate justice can only be achieved by challenging this model and by reorganizing mobility, regionalizing the economy and overcoming global inequity. So of course our report is very limited by focusing on aviation measures, but in the context of justice. And um, I think step by step with many different civil society actors, social tipping points are possible and must be achieved before we, we get to the climate tipping points. Um, when reviewing the different measures outlined in the report, we see that they actually complement each other. So working to implement a fiscal tax while also calling for regulation of aviation activity, and calling for limits and bans, um, as well as promoting alternatives totally makes sense all, to, all together. And we both need um, bottom-up processes. So we need um, organizations that implement institutional travel policies or personal behavior change or musicians and bands and football players and politicians who stop flying. Um, and we also need top-down measures. But top-down policy changes won't be achieved if there is not enough pressure from below. And only relying on, on convincing individuals and companies to change their behavior is way too slow. So both has to go along with each other. Um, this um, system change and behavior change and top down and bottom up. And uh, what is clear is that we cannot only talk about stopping flying, but to create more positive narratives also about, about light <laughs> traveling. Um, about slow traveling, about um, alternatives to, to flying and the advantages of it. Um, we also have a few recommendations for civil society because our report is mostly targeted towards um, organizations and activist groups who, who deal with aviation and airports or who might want to do that in the future, hopefully. Um, so we we definitely recommend to those civil society stakeholders not discuss about green or decarbonized aviation or to 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 actually use those terms but to call for a reduction of flights or degrowth of aviation because that's what the aviation industry does anyways. They are talking about greening flights, they're talking about technologies, and um, of course they do that because that's the only way they can, um, they can publicly, uh, um, they can actually uh, say that they will continue to grow because in the current current climate crisis, um, they just need to show that there's some, some kind of greening efforts and we know that they won't work so we don't have to to repeat those messages from the industry but actually counter this and ask for a reduction of flights. We also make a strong case for continually checking the proposed measures for their social justice implications and um, when NGOs or activist groups think about campaigns it is of course necessary to have a focus and a concrete demand and it is important to choose those demands and, and strategy carefully while keeping the overall, overall vision in mind when communicating about the specific case. So for example, degrowth and climate justice. And also allowing others to have their strategies and tactics 
be it lobbying or lawsuits or direct action and civil disobedience in order to attract media, media attention. Because um, when our movement becomes strong enough to challenge corporate interests, repressive tactics can be expected from the industry and actually um, the IATA, the International Aviation Industry Lobby is already um, proclaiming that they will start a huge campaign in order to to counter the, the shaming of aviation. Um, so um, there might be attempts actually also to divide the movement. So we need to pay attention to not allow splits in the movement for climate justice and aviation reduction, but to respect different tactics and campaign focuses and exchange ex experiences. Um, I think building solidarity through networking like we do it in the Stay Grounded Network is key to bringing about the systemic change needed. And additionally, we might also need to reach out to new and creative alliances like trade unions demanding a just transition, migrant organizations, human rights organizations, doctors calling for fine dust regulations and others in order to make our movement bigger. So this was all from my part on the on the summary. Thank you, um, Matt, Lena. Um, and thank you all for listening. Now it's the time for discussion. Um, I hope um, you still have some time and energy for posing questions or also giving your opinion maybe on, on what you just heard and what you think about which of those measures are maybe likely to implement and where are the obstacles or where do you see a need to discuss further what is maybe missing i think we have the like yeah some time now to openly talk about about our ideas on on this report and i would be happy to to hear from you yes even or ivan i don't know how to yeah, it's, it's even, even, it's even. Yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah um, could, could you say a little bit more about um, uh, what Magdalena, what you just uh, told about the, the technologies? So you said that uh, what uh, the aviation um, companies are talking about uh, is not uh, going to happen because that's what is a big uh, issue uh, right now here that um, they tell a lot of things and um, it's difficult for, for, for uh, yeah, people to, uh, to know whether it, it is correct or not, uh, because, since, well, it's difficult to challenge if, if you don't really know what, um, what the problems are with the, those technologies that they are talking about. Yes. Um. So I was um, just a couple of weeks ago at the forum of the environmental agency in, in Germany. They released a new report on environmentally friendly aviation, which is exactly the term which I wouldn't use. <laughs> and they also had invited lots of industry representatives and scientists. And I think it gave a good picture of what's the current um, situation also of, of Screening strategies and technological solutions, and for me, it was uh, in, in the German debate. Um, synthetic fuels are the ones um, pushed most. So, power to liquid technologies, which are possible, it is possible to create um, aviation fuel through um, an electric electric energy which is then um, transferred in a, in a chemical process into liquid fuel um, but the thing is that it really doesn't exist yet so there's like almost no supply of those fuels and if we would um, if we would mm, change that then the, the current demand for aviation fuel, we, we would need to use the whole renewable energy production of, of the world in order to um, only fuel our planes, while we actually need to 
switch everything to renewable energy, <laughs> our industries and our heating and our agriculture and our, our transport on the ground. So it is totally not feasible to say, okay, we can rely on, on synthetic fuels for aviation. Um, so this is like the most promising technology. <laughs> and, um, and then they're talking, of course, also about electric planes and that they've already existed, but it's only planes that are for one or two persons. And by no way we can electrify planes for passenger and uh, transport of or for the transport of goods. So it's, it's really, it's, it's, there's also a very good study that has analyzed the, um, the technology myths um, proclaimed by the industry in the last decades. And it basically shows that there have always been those um, promises by the industry that very soon there will be technological solutions and they never came and they probably won't come. I mean, it would be great if there really was a very clean option, but um, it's very, very unrealistic. But you can read more about that also in the other report we have. Thanks, Lena. Now Hans raised his hand. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, better. better. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, I put, uh, rearranged the microphone. Yeah, so what I was uh, talking about a, a little bit ago was about this uh, this taxes on the taxes on uh, uh, diesel and gasoline, like you show in your diagram number two in your in your report, actually, the, and these are taxes actually that most people are uh, is targeted with. Yeah, so we have the kerosene tax like four point something euros, and the others is over seventy euros. Yeah, for for the same unit of CO two emissions, so the taxes are very much higher, and this is where people, in general, and even poorer people suffer with that. It's, not with this kerosene tax. So I think we should point out that the taxes on fuels uh, that we use in our daily lives, or most people use in their daily lives, are very high, whereas uh, the tax on aviation is actually very, is actually very low. So um, I think it's, import it's, it's an important point. The other things that uh, also Madalena was talking about, it's, it's all like science fiction that the aviation industry wants to to distract us actually from what 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 is uh, what what is what is important um, and an, another point that i want to talk would like to talk about that we talk about this two percent that was funded for talking about the two the aviation industry said it's only two percent of co2 emissions are due to aviation but if you go to europe it's like five percent that is uh, of CO2 emissions are due to aviation. And if we multiply it with this factor two or three that should be used to, to use, uh, uh, then we already in 10% of, uh, of it's, it's in Europe, it's, it's, uh, the percentage is quite high and we should use this, these values. And um, here in Portugal, we, 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 we did a calculation, or colleagues of uh, the University of Lisbon did a calculation, what would it mean that all these airport expansion plans would go ahead and we would decarbonize the rest of the industry? That would mean that seven, almost 70% of CO2 emission and it would be due to aviation in 2050. So if uh, that is, I think we should, try to point out this, uh, these calculations, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Yeah, I think this is a really important, um, like one really important fact in, in all the, um, the communication about aviation and its climate impact, that it's systematically like um, neglect, like their numbers and facts systematically neglected and out of reasons of, of course because it comes from the aviation industry so one of our tasks is to to tell people what are the actual numbers what are the actual impacts and why are the communicated numbers so low thank you um even i don't know if you wanted to say something more or was it still from before your hand uh, yes i just wanted to ask hans uh, 
the last thing you said uh, with the 70 percent is that the worldwide or was it just in portugal no that would that would be the percentage of uh, 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 that the aviation sector would contribute to of the co2 emissions of the whole country if this plan for decarbonization no, decarbonization of the of, of, of would go uh, ahead yes because they have this this plan that uh, countries should present to the european Co commission about the decarbonization of the of the of all of the uh, of all the country and so the plan that the portuguese government presented which excluded obviously aviation uh, 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 had a certain amount of CO2 emissions and the aviation sector, if all these plans to increase the airports would go ahead, would contribute 70% of CO2 emissions. But in Portugal, that's a Portuguese number, and they were considered the flights that were uh, uh, leaving Portugal. Now that, so that was the calculation that was, uh, because many times when they make these calculations, they only consider the, the landing and, and, and the takeoff, and not what is emitted in the whole, whole flight. So when they, for instance, here did this, this env environmental impact study uh, of the Montijo airport, they only calculated the CO2 emissions of takeoff and landing, and not all the emissions during the flight in, in, it, in itself. So that they, they to really, uh, yeah, fake the numbers, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think maybe just to mention um, that there was a re report also by the European Environmental Agency, which said that if we if there's nothing done from um, to reduce aviation, like if it continues to grow like it does now by 2050, um, there will like there could be a quarter of all carbon like of all our carbon budget used by the aviation industry. So this is like a very official study by the European Environmental Agency. Now, Tony, you wanted to say something. Yeah, thank you. I, I just uh, wanted to uh, comment a bit on what Hans said, because I totally agree that these things are very important. And uh, the, the first, uh, to take the first issue first about the lack of taxation of the keros of kerosene, uh, I think I might have mentioned it, but I can say a bit more, which we also mentioned in the report that the yellow uh, vest problem in France has exactly been that normal people can, who are disprivileged cannot uh, manage to get their daily life to function with these kind of uh, um, taxation of petrol, which is needed to actually try to raise the price so that there is an actual reduction of the activity but it's it just shows how socially unfair it is and it has been mentioned in that um, context exactly why do we not start addressing kerosene instead it would not affect people's daily life in the same way and it has huge uh, climate impact and it's not at all taxed so it's really uh, quite absurd <laughs> that it's not being uh, discussed more. So the, the whole taxa taxation race in France, which is called off and nothing more has happened so far. Um, and yeah, and on the numbers, um, the 2% worldwide number, I agree. It's really important that people in each country also try to find out what the, the right number for their country is. And in this respect, it also brings me back to this accounting figures. Um, trying to find out what the actual CO2 emission from flying is in your country is also not so easy because the official statistic number usually published by the Environmental Protection Agency or the statistical office only shows the emissions that are actually reported to the, to the UNFCCC, which do not include international aviation. So they're already at the outset kind of wrong. And uh, and it's true that in most European countries, the, even the CO2 emissions alone are much higher than the 2%. So in France, they're also about 10% currently. And uh, in the UK, there's a similar situation as Portugal, that if uh, somebody has calculated that if Heathrow Airport expansion goes forward, uh, the aviation sector will consume seven, roughly 70% of UK's uh, carbon budget in 2050. 
Okay, thank you for this addition. Are there any more questions or comments? Peter? Uh, wait, we have to unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I think the report is a perfect guideline to reduce aviation by passengers. I miss uh, what we could do about uh, transportation of goods because that is increasing enormously. And I see the discussion uh, in Amsterdam, for instance, on Schiphol. They want to, every passenger's flight with this has been deleted. Immediately, immediately the place is taken over by uh, a freight uh, flyer. So everything we do to shift people to other transportations, that slot will be taken by transportation by air. And they even discussed, I saw a report yesterday, that the amount of freight in the region of Amsterdam has grown uh, by 10%. Uh, by air, it has reduced by 20%. And they say we need 100,000 more slots for ship haul because we reduce then the CO2 emissions because we fly uh, with less CO2 than the goods we are now coming uh, via road traffic. So uh, the, the emphasis here lies on passenger flights. So I'm asking why. <laughs> is that clear? Because Yes, yes it is. Um, Jonah, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, just to say that it's a really important point and um, yeah, well, I didn't know it was so uh, so serious as you say that they actually take over when passenger flights close down. So that shows that this is really something to look into, which is which we, yeah, yeah. Which we mentioned just kind of in the side of the report. But thanks for that uh, warning. <laughs> no, no, because you... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I think Lena wanted to add something as sorry. an answer. Yes, um, just as I um, know that um, I think 30% of the income for the aviation industry comes from trade of goods, but I think it's only very few percent of the weight um, airplanes carry, so it is really mostly passengers um like consuming the kerosene burned mm, but yes I, I i do agree we only have a very short section on this on this trade of in goods and i mean we talk about the need for regionalizing transport and, and the trade but um yes we should definitely also dig more into this no, but, but the, the, have we discussed bans on on flights and and there is a, a slot was on the ship hall for 500,000 flights and the transportation, the flight transportations wants to earmark the new slots just for uh, their purpose. They want to get rid of the easy jets and of the uh, Ryanair of this world just to replace them by freight transport. So everything we achieve by doing all uh, what's in this uh, plan, I, I think yeah, the place will be taken over by uh, other aviation so and here I, I live nearby uh, Liège um, Alibaba is spending uh, 1 billion euro to expand the airport and if you have seen a couple of weeks ago on single days Alibaba sold 38 billion goods on internet and a lot of them come to, uh, to hear. So that's, it's a, a massive grow, more than uh, on uh, passenger uh, aviation. So that's why, wh 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 where I'm worried about. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a really important point. I think also that some of those measures actually um, mustn't be, like, not necessarily have to be addressed only towards passion passenger flights. So if we're talking about I think it's our task then also as people spreading this report and the measures to to talk about limits on flights in general. So if we're demanding for flights, we should demand for limits on flights, not only on passengers, but in general. Then also moratoria on airport infrastructure 
will of course also limit the possibility for further flights for either passengers or freight. And also kerosene tax, I think is something that is generally addressing both, both of them. So some, I, I see that some of the measures have the possibility also to address it, but yeah, I think it's a very important point to, to um, stress that we really need to have a look at this, that it's not replaced then by freight. Now, Hans wanted to say something. Yes, yes I, I just want to add actually to what Peter said that all this, uh, all this uh, trade and that we are doing and all this. Can you uh, speak up a bit? Uh, yeah, excuse me. All this trade, uh, what we are, what we are doing over the internet, and all this Amazon and Alibaba has really a very uh, big impact. And and I think that most of us know very little about the real impact of this stuff. So I just want to reinforce maybe that we should try to do some investigation and research actually into this uh, into this point. What is the real role of this uh, commercial uh, uh, and um, Fly, freight flights, yeah, because I, I, I personally, yeah, I, I must say that I have a lack of information actually on this point. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more other questions on the report or the measures or the comments? It just, just, just one very short uh, <coughs> remark. It's actually great the report that you did, and it was great work. And I really congratulate you on this on this great report. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a good uh, a good closing word for the discussion. And then I would uh, hand over to to Lena for some uh, closing words. Um, yes. So um, thank you for the discussion. I think um, this is just a start and I really hope that also by, by emails we can um, discuss more about the report and about measures to degrow aviation. Um, there already came some feedback. Also um, people ask or someone asking why didn't we explicitly name that we should eliminate the first class or business class on planes. It's, we say that they might need to cost more, but we did not really say that they should be eliminated. So I think that's a great idea too. And we also didn't discuss in depth contingents um, on like personal contingents uh, of like what's personal right to, to fly. Is, was, would that be something that's, that's necessary? Like one flight every 10 years, no more. Um, but I think that's maybe something that's that would be too um, well that would be too shocking for <laughs> for society and policymakers at this moment but maybe in the future it might be something we need to think about too and um, now also we heard that the transport of good goods um, could be included more so I think we will we will collect all this feedback and this will feed into our work we do at Stay Grounded and our member organizations. And um, we hope that, yeah, that the report can, can serve to, to make more effective campaigns and to really deep grow aviation in the future. So um, just to mention that the report is now, we have it now in English, it's being translated into Spanish right now, and soon it probably also will be translated into German. We already have a fact sheet or a briefing paper in, in three languages. Um, we have a video clip on the report. You might have seen it. You are we are happy if you can use the illustrations. Um, if you can share the information on social media and also the PowerPoint we are using now can of course be used for other events and presentations. And just to mention that on Saturday, there will be the International Aviation Day. And there was a proposal to make some media, social media action and um, share some, some posts on Twitter and Facebook. So just uh, follow us and, and 
uh, participate in that if you want. So that's um, all I have to say from my side. Thank you for joining and have a good evening or day wherever you're located at. <laughs>